The X-15 was a hypersonic rocket-powered aircraft operated jointly by NASA and the United States Air Force as part of the X-plane series of experimental aircraft. It was basically a rocket engine with a cockpit and stabilizers attached to it that could fly to altitudes that were outside of Earth's atmosphere. There were only three of them made and they were numbered X-15 number one, X-15 number two, and X-15 number three. On the morning of November 15, 1967, at 9.13 a.m., a B-52 lifted off from Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California's Mojave Desert. Attached underneath its right wing was the X-15 No. 3 aircraft being piloted by United States Air Force Major Michael James Adams. The mission's objective that day was to be released 230 miles away over Delamar Dry Lake in Nevada, get up to an altitude of 250,000 feet and head back to Edwards Air Force Base's dry lake bed. During the flight, several science experiments were to be conducted. At 45,000 feet in altitude, Major Adams and X-15 No. 3 were launched from the B-52 at 10.30 and 7 seconds in the morning. After ignition and the power on phase, all systems on the aircraft were functioning normally. One minute and 21 seconds later, at 10.31 and 28 seconds, when the aircraft was at 140,000 feet in altitude and climbing, the internal flight data system computer and instrument malfunction lights illuminated. Engine shutdown occurred two seconds later at 10.31 and 30 seconds. The internal flight data system computer and instrument malfunction lights could not be reset. Three seconds later, at 10.31 and 33 seconds, The pilot switched the attitude director indicator to the precision attitude indicator mode, then began the wing rocking maneuver. The wing rock maneuver lasted about 47 seconds and was completed at 10.32 and 20 seconds. During the rocking maneuver, the electrical system was able to be reset, but at 10.32 and 25 seconds, a second electrical disturbance occurred in the aircraft. As a result of the second disturbance, the aircraft started a slow yaw drift to the right. Ground control could see evidence of control problems. 17 seconds later, at 10.32 and 42 seconds, flight control reported, Have you coming over the top? You're looking real good. Right on heading, Mike. The aircraft was not responding to the pilot inputs. At 10.32 and 50 seconds, the pilot initiated the precision attitude tracking task and the aircraft stabilized, then resumed normal flight operations. One second later, at 10.32 and 51 seconds, flight control reported, Over the top at about 261, Mike. At 10.33, he was at a maximum altitude of 266,000 feet. And at 10.33 and 2 seconds, flight control said, You're a little bit hot, but your heading is going in the right direction, Mike. At 10.33 and 10 seconds, the nose of the X-15 was yawing 18 degrees to the right. Ground control had no way of knowing this. At 10.33 and 14 seconds, ground control said, Okay, let's check your dampers, Mike. Dampers were basically the control systems on the aircraft that direct the aircraft correctly and safely. When the X-15 is in Earth's atmosphere, it uses three stabilizers. One is a horizontal stabilizer. A horizontal stabilizer is on the tail of the plane and is parallel with the horizon. This stabilizer houses the elevator, which is responsible for up and down direction of the aircraft, known as pitch. Next is the vertical vertical stabilizer. The vertical stabilizer is also on the tail and points up and down and houses the rudder. The rudder is responsible for left and right direction, which is known as yaw. Third is the wings. The wings keep the aircraft flying and they house the ailerons. The ailerons roll the plane left or right. Once the X-15 is out of Earth's atmosphere, the damper system it uses is called the reaction control system. The reaction control system is made up of thrust rockets on the nose of the aircraft and the wings of the aircraft. The two thrusters on the top of the nose will push the nose down, and the two thrusters on the bottom of the nose will push the nose up. The two thrusters on the left side of the nose will push the nose right, and the two thrusters on the right side of the nose will push the nose left. The thruster on top of the left wing and the thruster on the bottom of the right wing will roll the plane counterclockwise, and the thruster on the top of the right wing and the thruster on the bottom of the left wing will roll the plane clockwise. Three seconds after ground control told Mike to check his dampers, at 10.33 and 17 seconds, Michael Adams said, they're still on. 
He was referring to the reaction control system, which would suggest the thrusters on the left side of the nose were in and on position. Three seconds later, at 10.33 and 20 seconds, the X-15 yaw was at 28 degrees to the right of the flight path. Four seconds later, at 10.33 and 24 seconds, flight control said, A little bit high, Mike, but real good shape, and we got you coming downhill now. Are your dampers still on? At this point, the yaw was at 90 degrees. 15 seconds later, at 10.33 and 39 seconds, at about 240,000 feet in altitude, Adams answered, Yeah, and it seems squirrely. Five seconds later, at 10.33 and 44 seconds, ground control said, Okay, have you coming back through 230,000 feet? Five seconds after that, at 10.33 and 49 seconds, Michael Adams was flying backwards along his intended flight path. Four seconds later, at 10.33 and 53 seconds, the X-15 entered a high-altitude hypersonic spin that lasted 43 seconds. During this spin, the aircraft lost 100,000 feet in altitude. Five seconds after the spin began, at 10.33 and 58 seconds, ground control said, Let's not keep it as high as normal with this damper problem. Have you at 210,000 feet? Four seconds later, at 10.34 and 2 seconds, Michael Adams said, I'm in a spin, Pete. Three seconds after that, at 10.34 and 5 seconds, ground control said, Let's get your experiment in and the camera on. Five seconds after that, at 10.34 and 10 seconds, Michael Adams switched the ballistic thruster control system to automatic in an attempt to stabilize the X-15. Six seconds later, at 10.34 and 16 seconds, Michael Adams said again, I'm in a spin. Two seconds later, at 10.34 and 18 seconds, ground control said, say again. At this point, the X-15 was spinning with the nose pointing straight towards the ground. One second later, at 10.34 and 19 seconds, Michael Adams said, I'm in a spin. This would end up being his last transmission. Two seconds after that, at 10.34 and 21 seconds, ground control said, say again. Adams did not respond. Six seconds later, at 10.34 and 27 seconds, ground control said, okay, Mike, you're coming through about 135,000 feet now. Seven seconds later, at 10.34 and 34 seconds, ground control said, let's get it straightened out. Two seconds later, at 10.34 and 36 seconds, the spin ended and the aircraft was on a zero degrees heading directly into the intended flight path at 120,000 feet at a speed of Mach 4.7, which is about 3,000 600 miles per hour. Eight seconds later, at 10.34 and 44 seconds, ground control said, get some angle of attack up. In other words, pull the nose of the plane up. Three seconds after that, at 10.34 and 47 seconds, the thruster control system was turned off for the final time after being turned off and on several times during the emergency. Three seconds later, at 10.34 and 50 seconds, ground control said, coming up to 80,000 feet, Mike. Two seconds later, at 10.34 and 52 seconds, the X-15 began to break apart, traveling at Mach 3.9, which is about 2,900 miles per hour. Three seconds later, at 10.34 and 55 seconds, there was one final thruster rocket control system pulse that occurred. It was possibly the last attempt for Michael Adams to gain control as the aircraft disintegrated around him. Three seconds later, at 10.34 and 58 seconds, the X-15 completely broke apart at 62,000 feet. At 10.34 and 59 seconds, ground control said, let's get some G on it. 15 seconds later, ground control said, keep pulling it up. Do you read, Mike? At 10.35 and 20 seconds, the approximate time the X-15 impacted the desert ground, ground control said, let's keep pulling it up, Mike. As the aircraft pitched up and down, it was pulling 15 Gs positive, and 15 G's negative. It was also pulling eight G's left and eight G's right. Michael Adams was incapacitated at this point and in my opinion, probably didn't survive the enormous G forces crushing his body. Either way, Air Force Major Michael Adams did not eject. The aircraft impacted the ground about 38.5 miles north, northeast of Edwards Air Force Base at this location right here. So here I am at the location where the fuselage impacted the ground. There's this really nice memorial here and X marks the spot where it impacted. If you look at this picture here, that's the back of the fuselage 
and you can see in the background the hills well from here that's those hills right there so the aircraft impacted here with the back of it pointing toward me right now if you walk up to the other side here turn around you can see in this photo right here that's the front of the aircraft and you can line it up with the hills in the background it should be those hills right right there so the center of the X is pretty much the center of the aircraft where it impacted the ground and I believe the cockpit with Michael Adams in it was right about right about here very possibly right where the registry is right there now this photo you see here was taken from about this location right here and you can see that little lighter section above the two men in the middle above their heads there that photo was taken from about here in that lighter section you can still see right there so that photo was taken from here and this is what the area looks like today So the aircraft impacted right there where the memorial is, which means it came from that direction, somewhere over there, crashing down here. According to NASA Technical Report Server, in their report, the time from launch at 10.30 and 7 seconds to the time of the X-15's catastrophic breakup at 10.34 and 54 seconds was a total time of about 4 minutes 47 seconds. And the time from launch to the time the aircraft impacted the desert ground was about 5 minutes 13 seconds. So what happened? After an extensive investigation, it was discovered the cause of the crash was the result of an experiment pod on the right wingtip. It was called the Traversing Probe. This probe was powered by a 115 volt 400 cycle electric motor. When it was tested in the altitude chamber at altitudes resembling 80,000 to 90,000 feet, the current from the electric motor would arc with a spark about a half an inch long. As the altitude increased above 90,000 feet, the arcing would reach further than half an inch. The higher the altitude, the larger the arc. One minute and 21 seconds after the X-15 was launched from the B-52 and when it was at 140,000 feet, it experienced the shutdown of the internal flight data system computer and the instrument malfunction lights illuminated. They concluded that at this altitude, the current arc was large enough to make contact with the X-15's electrical system, which caused the internal flight data system computer shutdown and the malfunction lights to illuminate. This traversing probe had been used on X-15 number one, and any arcing would have gone unnoticed because the early X-15 model number one had a much less complex electrical system than the later model in the X-15 number three. X-15 number three's electrical system was far more sensitive than the electrical system in X-15 number one. The X-15 also had a control safety built-in called the MH-96. The MH-96 would sense air pressure on the control surfaces such as the elevators, the rudder, and the ailerons. When it sensed high pressure, it would not allow the pilot to overstress the aircraft. So, at high speeds, if the pilot pushed or pulled the controls their full range, 
The MH-96 would only allow the control surfaces to move within a safe range in order to prevent full deflection of the control surfaces from overstressing the aircraft. As the X-15 flew out of the Earth's atmosphere and the MH-96 sensed little to no pressure on the control surfaces, the MH-96 would transfer control over to the reaction control system. The reaction control system is the small thrusters on the nose and the wings. These thrusters allowed the aircraft to be controlled in very little to no atmosphere outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When the traversing probe arced into the X-15's electrical system, it paralyzed the MH-96. Once the MH-96 was non-operational, it could no longer transfer control to the reaction control system. The first arc paralyzed the MH-96 for about 60 seconds. During those 60 seconds, the pilot began the wing rocking maneuver because there was still enough atmosphere for the control surfaces to react to at those high speeds. The electrical system was able to be reset at the end of those 60 seconds, and the aircraft gained thruster control at that time. But a few seconds later, at 10.32 and 25 seconds, a second arc and electrical disturbance coursed through the aircraft around the same time the aircraft began a slight yaw to the right. Without the reaction control system operating, the yaw could not be corrected. The pilots and the engineers believed that the slight yaw began because Michael Adams was slightly distracted by what was going on with the aircraft's electrical system. Had the reaction control system been operating properly, it would have been an easy adjustment for the pilot to correct. But since the MH-96 could not transfer control to the reaction control system properly, Michael Adams could not make the necessary adjustments. And unfortunately, it ended in a disaster for Michael Adams, his family, and the X-15 program. In 2004, they placed a very nice memorial on the location where the X-15 impacted the ground. It is open to the public 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and access is fairly easy. If you're ever in the area, I highly recommend you visit the location and pay your respects to United States Air Force Major Michael James Adams. So there you have it, right here on the Forrest Haggerty Channel the flight and impact location of X-15 number 3, which took place on November 15, 1967.